Hello everyone in Earth Sciences, this is Dr. Hurt, and we are now on our last week of lectures, so you're probably happy about that. I know it's been a long semester with a lot of uh, crazy stuff, right? So uh, anyway, we are just going to be finishing up this week with our uh, lectures on astronomy and uh, the solar system. So we're going to be kind of looking out now from Earth, out beyond, and kind of looking at Earth's neighbors, but also today we're going to be focusing on an important part of the Earth, which is our night sky, you know, because that's the part of the Earth that for thousands and thousands of years people were studying intensely. It's probably the most, you know, uh, has the longest history of any of our physical sciences. So um, we're going to be kind of looking first today at the history of astronomy and the night sky and studies of the night sky. So astronomy is Again, it's the kind of the study of the night sky. And we're also going to take a tour of the night sky. We have like a virtual planetarium. I want to kind of take you through and just look at some things. So uh, I think the first thing we're going to do is I'm just going to show you some things in a virtual planetarium. And then we're going to turn to this stuff and uh, look at uh, the golden age of astronomy. Look at some of the history of astronomy and where it, where it came from, where that science came from. So first I'm going to cut over here and take a look at this virtual uh a virtual planetarium. So this is what the night sky would look like tonight. Actually, I'm going to make it sort of to, yeah, this would be at about nine o'clock tonight. So you see the, the date is 2021, April 19th, uh, and the time is nine o'clock at okay, 9.25. So anyway, um, that's where we're at. Now, um, what you're looking at is you're looking to the south. So there's the south. There, by the way, there's a lot of phone apps that actually you can just point the phone at a constellation. It'll tell you what you're looking at. So one of the easiest constellations to find is uh, in the south, looking at the southern sky, is the constellation Orion. You probably have heard of Orion's Belt. And Orion's Belt is right there. You see those three bright stars in a row? So those are usually pretty easy to find in the night sky. Now, obviously, because of light pollution, things don't look like this in Corpus Christi. But actually, if you go out to the island um, on a clear day, it, it can kind of look a little bit like this, pretty close. Now, Orion is right there. I'm going to turn on the constellation so you can see it. There's Orion. And Orion is a warrior, so that's his bow. And he's got a weapon up there, and these are his shoulders. One of his shoulders is a star called Betelgeuse. And um, kind of the, the, not his foot, but sort of the corner of his skirt there is Regal, which is a very bright star as well. So Orion's pretty easy to find because it's got Orion's belt and Betelgeuse is pretty bright and it's a little bit kind of red color and Regal is also pretty bright. Next to Orion is also, you, you can easily find this star right here. This is Sirius. Sirius is part of Canis Major. Okay, and then. Um, Procyon is pretty easy, um, easy to find as well because it's a bright star, and that's part of the constellation Canis Minor. Okay, so there's the little dog, okay, Canis Minor. There's the Canis Major, the big dog, and there's Orion. Okay, so um, and then you know what? Between Canis Minor and Canis Major, there's Monoceros, which is the unicorn. And try as I might, I can never see it because it's too it's too dim. So anyway, those are just some really easy ones to find, and you can kind of impress your friends by looking at the constellations, the finding constellations in the sky. And then one also that's pretty easy to find, um, that's going to turn off the constellation art here, and the constellations for a second. But one that's also pretty easy to find is next to Betelgeuse and Sirius and Procyon. It, are these two stars right next to each other? They're usually like almost at the very apex of, they're usually like, often when you go outside, they're right up in the middle of the sky. And those, um, that's Castor and Pollux. Those are the twins. That's the constellation Gemini. Okay, Gemini. So there you can see Gemini right there. So um, Gemini means, means the twins. Now, one thing that you might notice here is you see a red line. The red line is the line of the ecliptic. That's the line that is going to show where the sun rises and sets. So if I um, kind of zoom in with the time, I'm going to make the sun come up, okay? And you'll see that the sun will follow that ecliptic line. So the sun's going to follow that ecliptic line. See that? So 
Another thing that you'll notice is there's a lot of constellations that fall along the ecliptic line. So the constellations that go along the ecliptic line you'll notice is Gemini. Okay, there's Gem. I'm trying to, got to turn on the, let me make it nighttime again so you can see. But some of the, let's take a look at the constellations that fall along the, um, the ecliptic line, okay? So it's Libra, Scorpius, Sagittarius, Capricorn, okay? Um, Virgo, Leo. So those probably sound familiar because those are the constellations that are part of like the um, people that like astrology. It's into, uh, you know, if they're into astrology, you probably know those because those are the ones that correspond to the different um, signs of the zodiac. And basically, um, that's that's like how you get, you know how people like, oh, they're born, if they're born in December or whatever, they're a Scorpius. It's because the sun is in the Scorpius constellation during that time, okay? So that's where that all that idea comes from, by the way. Just thought you might be interested in knowing that. So anyway, um, I do want to show you something very, very important about how stars move in the night sky here. So if you take a look, I'm going to turn off the constellation art here. I'm going to turn off the constellations. I want you to look, I'm going to kind of zoom through time, and I want you to look at what happens to the stars, okay? So I'm going to start zooming through time in minutes. Notice that the stars don't stay put throughout the course of the day they are moving, right? They are setting and rising just like the sun. Now see, the sun is gonna rise. And you know, as you know, the stars are just, just like the sun is a star. The sun rises and sets and every star rises and sets. Every star rises in the east and sets in the west. Every, the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. You'll notice that all the planets rise in the east and set in the west. So you'll also notice um, the moon, when the moon comes out, Let's kind of go back in time so we can see the moon again. I'm going to find the moon. Where's the moon? There it is. Did I see the moon? I don't know what the phase of the moon is. Oh, there's the moon. You'll notice that the moon also is going to rise in the east. Okay, I'm going to kind of go back in time. I'm going to look to the east here. And you'll notice that the moon too rises in the east and it's going to set eventually in the west okay and so do all the planets so the stars the moon the planets the sun they all rise in the east they set in the west okay what is that bright star over there it's so bright you can see it during the day i wonder what that is but um anyway i can't i can't click on it it doesn't let me click on it so whatever it might even be serious but um, anyway, another thing I want you to notice here, this is kind of annoying the way this works, um, is that all of the planets fall along, and the moon, all move along the ecliptic line, okay? And the reason, so you see there's the sun, there's Venus, there's Mars, there's the moon. They all fall more or less along the ecliptic line. And the reason that um, they all fall along the ecliptic line is simply because the moon, the stars, not the stars, but the moon, the planets, and the sun all all orbit in the same plane, right? So, well, the, the sun doesn't, everything's orbit. I should sit, re rephrase that. The earth and all the planets and the moon are all orbiting more or less in the same plane around the sun. So because they do that, they all follow the line of the ecliptic, okay? So you're going to see the sun, the moon, all the planets are going to rise in the east in the same place on the horizon and they're all going to set in the west more or less in the same place in the horizon so um, one last thing I want to show you just kind of basic stuff about the night sky that I bet a lot of people didn't know about and that's kind of why I'm trying to give you this virtual tour because you know maybe maybe if we were farmers in the 1800s you you everybody would know this stuff but you know, we're, we're not used to looking at the night sky too much anymore, so I'm kind of trying to show you. Um, but anyway, I want to show you something about how the planets move in relation to the stars. So I'm going to make it nighttime again. Okay, now let's look at how the stars move. Notice all the stars move together. Okay, everything moves together. Well, not everything. Okay, but you notice the moon, the stars, the planets, there's Mars. 
everything's kind of moving together. Okay. However, okay, instead of moving in terms of minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move in terms of days. Okay. So I'm going to start moving in terms of days. And let me find a nice juicy planet around here. There's the moon. I kind of want to find a planet though. Let me let me go back in time a little bit. Uh, there's there's how about Mars? Mars is perfect. Okay. Let's look at what Mars does. And, and I'm going to I'm going to fast forward instead of fast forwarding in in like minutes or hours, I'm going to fast forward in days, okay? So here I go. I'm going to start fast forwarding. I got April 19th right now. I'm going to start fast forwarding. Notice that whoa, look at there's Venus, there's Mercury over there. Okay? Notice that the stars all move together, but Venus, Mars, Mercury, all the planets, and of course the moon don't move with the stars. Ooh, boy, Venus is really bright that time, huh? It was really bright. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, that was February. Or no, September. Okay. Um, no, I don't remember that because that's in the future. So <laughs> I guess Venus is going to get really close during that time. But anyway, um, so I'm just trying to make the point that the planets do not move with the rest of the stars. Boy, look how bright Venus is going to be. We're going to have to see that. Venus is brighter than Jupiter during this time. That's crazy. Okay, so I'm just trying to make the point that the planets do not move with the rest of the stars. All the stars move together, but the planets don't, and the moon doesn't move with it. And obviously, the sun doesn't move with the stars either. Okay, so um, that's all I want to show you. Thank you for your patience in watching this little um, kind of little introduction to the night sky but you know i just trying to give you some basic basic uh because i can't take you out and actually show you this stuff i'm just trying to give you some basic uh idea of what what goes on when you look at the night sky so my cursor is missing isn't that annoying okay um current slide there we go there is my cursor's back okay so anyway um this is going to give you that so that little introduction to the night sky is going to give you a little bit more context for understanding the um, history of astronomy. So we're going to start off with basically one of the greatest intellectual, uh, <laughs> you know, the very foundations of Western civilization's thought and intellectual development started with, well, since they started with, but this is a major figure, it's Aristotle. Okay, so Aristotle lived uh, in ancient Greece. Okay, and this is 350 BC, so 350 years before Christ, we're talking about. Uh, a very very long time ago right so now 20 you know close to 2400 years ago so um, uh, Aristotle knew a lot of pretty surprising things about uh, the ancient you know about astronomy so one of the things contributions that he had is he showed that um, the circular shadow that is cast by the earth onto the moon during a lunar eclipse, so this is these are pictures sh uh, shown during a lunar eclipse. He noticed that 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 shadow of the Earth cast on the Moon is circular. So he assumed, uh, reasoned that if that is circular, that means that Earth must be circular, must be round. Okay. So um, realizing that Earth is not flat but round might sound very basic to us. Well, I guess it's not basic to everybody. There's still flat Earth people, but. Uh, it's it's a, a major major development in understanding right so what did aristotle do realize that the earth is spherical so that's a big deal now in aristotle's view the way that he understood the solar system is of course he thought it was geo geocentric that means that the earth is stationary in the middle and the sun rotates around the earth along with all the other planets and the moon and the stars okay and of course now, we might laugh at that now, but it made sense at the time because it doesn't feel like we're moving. We are moving, of course. We're orbiting around the sun, but it doesn't feel like we're moving. And you see all of the planets and uh, you see the stars and, this, and the moon, everything else going around us in the night sky. So it certainly looks like, you know, we are, we are moving or sorry, uh, that those are orbiting around us. OK, so he actually divided up um, the the, um, the way that he thought of the solar system is that there were nine concentric shells, okay? And you might ask, where did he get the nine? Well, remember what we just looked at, how the planets and the stars and the sun moved. One shell had the sun, another shell had the moon, 
another shell had um, the planets and different planets, and he noticed that different planets did not move with each other. Okay, so they could see at this time they could see Venus. They can see, and by the way, you can still see with the naked eye. You can see Venus very early in the morning. By the way, you can you can always see Venus early in the morning, uh, or not always, but almost always see Venus early in the morning. Uh, it's a morning planet. You can't see it during the middle of the day or in the middle of the night. Okay, so it's only an early morning thing, and I can explain why next next lecture. Uh, there's you can you can see uh, Saturn, and you can see Jupiter, and you can see. Mars, and you can see Mercury, and then you can see the rest of the stars, all the stars. And he noticed that all the stars moved together, but that Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, those, now of course he didn't realize they were planets, he thought they were stars, he knows that those things moved on their own. And the sun of course moves on its own independently from the rest of the stars. The moon moves independently through the night sky, independent of you know, the other stars. And what's number nine? I'm not sure. I feel like I'm missing something. There was a ninth one. Maybe it's just the Earth. I'm not sure. But you'll notice that there are nine sh One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, there are eight. Oh, maybe there's only eight shells. Well, whatever. I can only think of eight. But I thought there were nine. So it doesn't matter. But the point is... That was the kind of the understanding of uh, a lot of Greek philosophers and scientists for a long time is that, uh, you know, of course, the Earth, the solar system is um, geocentric. The Earth is the center of the solar system. OK, um, another like this guy was so cool. This is Aristophanes. So, er sorry, not Aristophanes, Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes was, um, again, ancient Greek. Um, Oh, by the way, I call this the golden age of astronomy. I think in your lecture assignment, I refer to it like astronomers in antiquity, or maybe I refer to them as classical astronomers, but it all means the same thing, like the golden age, classical age, antiquity. It all It's all referring to this age, age of ancient Greece and Rome. Okay, So um, Eratosthenes was just incredible scientist. I mean, this guy was so brilliant. It's amazing. So Eratosthenes, believe this or not, he actually figured out, and again, this was 2,400 years ago, he figured out 99% correctly the dia diameter circumference of the Earth. He figured out how big the Earth actually is. Not only is that a sphere, but he figured out how big that sphere is. And the way he did it is he measured, um, he, he, he put down just a straight stick, it's very simple, he put down a straight stick in, in the mud, or in the sand, in Aswan, a city called Aswan down south on the Nile. And he looked at the shadow length at noonday, okay, at, at, the, at noon. So he looked at the shadow length. And from that, he calculated the angle here, whatever that angle is. Let's say it was, I don't know what, 27 degrees, okay? So he figured out, okay, it's 27 degrees. Then he went up here to Alexandria. I'm going to get my yellow pen out. Alexandria was, like, of course, like a huge city back then in Egypt. And he looked again at the shadow, okay? And he saw that the shadow was different. This was maybe like 20 degrees instead of 27 degrees. So he reasoned that because this angle here is different by 7 degrees, that the distance between Aswan and Alexandria must be 1 50th of the circle. And you might be saying, like, why 1 50th? Well, um, the reason is, is that there are 360 degrees in a circle, right? So 7 degrees divided by 360 degrees is equal to 1 over 50, right? So, or it's about approximately equal to 1 over 50. So he reasoned that the difference, the, the distance between Aswan and um, Alexandria must be 1 50th of the circle. So Aswan is 785 kilometers away from Alexandria, and therefore Earth, or it must be 3,000, th sorry, 39,400 kilometers in size, which is almost dead on accurate. Right now, the current 
estimate is 40,000. So, I mean, he was really, really close. I can get my calculator out. I'm just kind of wondering how close he was. 39,400 divided by 40,075. So, yeah, he was uh, less than 2% off, 1.7% off. Extremely close. And that's, like, really amazing because there's, like, people here that, seriously, they don't even know the Earth is you know they think the earth is flat and people understood 2400 years ago the earth wasn't flat and they not only understood that but they knew how big it was too pretty crazy um another very important scientist during that time or back then they called themselves natural philosophers was um aristarchus aristarchus was one of the first astronomers to suggest that maybe um we could explain all of these movements of the sun and the moon and the stars uh, we could explain them by, um, instead of talking about kind of shells, talking about Earth orbiting around the sun. So he was one of the first people to advocate for a heliocentric, there's the sun in the center, a heliocentric um, orbit of, of uh, uh, orientation of the solar system where Earth is going around the sun. So obviously, very, very important um, contribution as well. So um, Aristarchus, however, just it was hard for him to compete with Aristotle because Aristotle's just a, cannot be overemphasized what a tremendous influence he was on all of Western civilization. So there's no way he was going to his ideas were going to compete and win out over Aristotle for the time being. So um, he kind of went by the wayside, and Aristotle's ideas of geocentrism were more prominent for a very long time until, of course, Copernicus and and. Um, those, you know, the Renaissance, basically. Um, so the next scientist to talk about is Hipparchus. Okay, again, ancient Greek. Um, Hipparchus was just, um, made so many great contributions just by mere observation. So he cataloged um, precise movements of over 850 stars. He categorized them according to brightness in a system that we still use today. So... Um, you know, the brightest star in the sky, by the way, you should know, is Sirius. Okay, Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. Okay, except the only things that will be brighter in the sky are sometimes um, Venus and Jupiter Some can sometimes be brighter. And of course, I mean the moon and the sun. But besides them, um, Venus and Jupiter some can sometimes be brighter than Sirius. So um, according to Hipparchus's um, categorization of brightness, um, one is the brightest star, so Sirius is about a one, and six is the faintest. The possibly like the very, very faintest star that you can see with the naked eye. So we rank things still on that scale of brightness from one to six, but of course they've expanded it now. But anyway, it um, doesn't matter. You don't need to know that for the test, but just some kind of general trivia you should be aware of for your life. Uh, so he created also a catalog of the stars. He also discovered, which was pretty amazing, he discovered a method to calculate the date and time of lunar eclipses. So he was able to predict lunar eclipses, which up until at this time, you know, nobody knew they were just like totally random events. So he was the first one to really understand exactly how and why they occur and um, when they are going to occur and make predictions. So again, pretty amazing scientist considering that he had so little i mean people at this time had no technology to do these observations but they were just very very smart people so um, they were able to figure this out with very little background in technology um another scientist here is ptolemy so you pronounce this ptolemy okay very important uh, roman now this guy is a roman scientist you could see he's coming a little bit later 141 a.d so 140 years after Christ. Um, Ptolemy explained, one of the things that he did is he really, uh, kind of his big contribution is that he really came up with a very comprehensive system for explaining the solar system and explaining all these movements that we see. Um, he also tried to explain a phenomenon called retrograde motion by uh, uh, this use of this idea of epicycles. So let me show you a little bit what retrograde motion is. But if you look at, um, the movement of Mars through the sky. Okay, so you go out, let's say day one, it'll be there. Day two, it'll be there. You go out day three, it will be there. And then so on and so forth. So you might just predict that, you know, by this time it would just keep going westward. But 
Instead, what it does is it goes back, it reverses, and then goes back the other way. And that was very perplexing to um, scientists at the time. They were like, how do you explain this? Because in their view, the way things worked is that, you know, you had this earth, okay, at the center, and then you had, of course, these concentric shells um, that, were, that were spinning around or moving or rotating around earth. Now, how do you explain these reversals? Okay, that was difficult for scientists at the time to explain. So the way they explained it was that um, some of the planets are doing these what are called epicycles, where they are rotating within their main rotation. Okay, so um, that was the idea, it lasted for a very long time, but eventually it was proved false. So actually retrograde motion, um, my videos never work on here, so I have to go here to to do um, videos, but um, let me whoops, let me show you the let me show you the video. I got to get out of this thing, and I'll show you this thing on retrograde motion. Okay, so this is actually what happens with retrograde motion. It's not epicycles. That was a false hypothesis. Actually, what where epi um, where retrograde motion comes from is that we overtake a planet in its orbit. Okay. So this is showing retrograde motion. Let me turn up the volume here so you can hear a little bit better. Whoops. Okay, so there's Mars up there. And again, Mars, see, Mars is gonna do a reversal in its path through the night sky. then it's going to continue along. So actually what's happening here is that we are overtaking Mars in its in its um, orbit. So every two years Mars appears to slow down and suddenly move backwards against the night sky before once again looping continue its usual west to east direction. Okay. So what's really happening is that we're going to over we, we overtake Mars in its orbit. So there's Earth, Mars is up here. And when we when we overtake a planet in its orbit, whether it's Venus or Mars or Mercury, it'll appear to retrograde. So there's Mars right there. Here comes Earth down here. And as we overtake Mars in its orbit, we see see as we overtake Mars in its orbit, we see it retrograde. Okay. So that's actually what's going on. Oh, I dropped my microphone. Okay, so the idea is that, you know, at the time, people were struggling to, to understand, um, understand uh, retrograde motions. It didn't really make a lot of sense in the context of geocentrism. So my point here is that, um, my point here is that things are kind of starting to come up around the seams um, come undone at the seams regarding geocentrism. Now, of course, after um, this time, 141 AD, you know, it wasn't too long after um, the time of Christ that the Roman Empire started to fall and crumble, and all learning kind of came to a halt. And that was during the Dark Ages, right? And uh, all of human, <laughs> all of the great, you know, accomplishments of humanity, or not humanity, but at least Western humanity, um, were preserved by, you know, usually preserved by monks and monasteries and it had to we had to wait a long time until there was a rebirth of civilization of course that rebirth is the renaissance okay so we had to wait till the renaissance to have these um, kind of a lot more progress to be made in ast astronomical sciences so that came with the the advent of these five men very very important astronomers uh, the first one is Nicholas Copernicus, and you've probably heard of Copernicus before, so he's the first one. Next one is Tycho Brahe. The next one is uh, Johannes Kepler and Galileo, and then the final one we'll mention is Isaac Newton. Okay, so uh, let's just go over quickly contributions of these five men. So uh, Copernicus was the first um, since Aristarchus to argue very persuasively for a heliocentric model. He was a Polish priest and um, 
Although, uh, you know, it, it's kind of funny because Galileo got in so much trouble with the church uh, regarding, you know, his work on um, uh, geocentrism and heliocentrism. Um, but, uh, you know, Copernicus was kind of, uh, for whatever reason, didn't get as much trouble. But he was actually the first to argue for a heliocentric model. So that was a, a huge contribution. So uh, the next one here is Tycho Brahe. This is a weird a weird name, Tycho Brahe. That's how you pronounce it. Tycho was a Danish scientist. He was given an appointment by the uh, Royal Danish Crown to and set up a independent, um, uh, basically a planetarium uh, to observe the stars. And he was able to very precisely observe the uh, positions and dates and times of different stars and planets in the sky. So he collected a tremendous amount of data. One kind of interesting thing about Tycho Brahe is he was an extremely arrogant man. And uh, he actually got in a bar fight with a mathematician over who was better at math. And uh, it came to blows and with swords and the other mathematician had cut off his nose. So Tycho Brahe actually had a bronze nose put in place. And you can still go see if you ever go to um, museums in Europe, you can go one day and see Tycho Brahe's uh, false nose. So that's just kind of, I don't know why they just didn't do math problems to figure out who was better at math, but whatever, uh, they, he lost his nose over it. So um, third guy here is Kepler. Kepler was a student of Brahe's, uh, a German, and um, used to do, uh, used all of his measurements to also argue very persuasively for a heliocentric model of the universe. And one of the things that Kepler also did was he developed um, three laws of planetary motions that were based on the observations of Brahe. So these three laws, um, you don't need to know these because they're very mathematical. Um, you don't need to know these kind of mathematically, but just kind of, if you can just generally understand what they mean and what they're about, uh, that would be sufficient for the test. So these are Kepler's three laws. First law is that each planet moves in an ellipse with the sun at one focus. So uh, orbits of planets around the sun are not circles, okay? So we don't move in a circle around the sun. We move in an ellipse. And with an ellipse, um, basically the, the outside of the ellipse is equal distance to the sum of the, is the this, this point, if you add this distance with this distance, it's always the same. So it's, it's, uh, it has two what are called uh, foci, or one focus, okay, another focus. The sun is at one of those focus, okay? So uh, it's an ellipse, it's not a circular orbit. Number two is that the line connecting a planet and the sun sweeps out an equal area in equal time. So the, um, this area, let me, let me, oh, well, not that, okay, let me, let me erase everything. So what that means is that here's planet at um, time one and time two and time three, okay? So this area right here connecting time one and time two is going to be the same as if I get a different color here. It's going to be the same area as what's swept out in um, time two to time three. Okay, so it sweeps out equal areas in equal times. All right. Uh, third one is that for all planets, the orbital period divided by the semi-major axis cubed is constant. I know that sounds very complicated. The major axis, you can think of the major axis as just the um, kind of average distance around the sun. Uh, so the idea here is that there's a relationship between the orbital period is how long it takes the planet to go around the sun, okay? That's orbital period. So you need to remember that for the next lecture when we talk about the solar system. So the orbital period is how long it takes a planet to go around the sun. The semi-major axis is just the distance from the planet to the sun, okay? So the idea is that the longer, the, or I should say the further the planet is from the sun, the longer it will take to go around the sun. Okay, so like Jupiter, you know, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, they're taking like decades to go around the sun. Whereas Mercury, 
very close to the sun only takes like I can't remember what like 60 days or something like that it's very fast okay now another huge huge figure I'm sure you know about Galileo Galileo Galilei was uh, a, an Italian I think this is part of the reason why Galileo got in such trouble with the church and like Kepler and Copernicus didn't um, but yeah, he did get put under. <laughs> One of my students was telling me he got burned at the stake. He didn't get burned at the stake. He got put under house arrest. Um, but anyway, Galileo uh, was an Italian, so maybe it's because he was close to the Vatican. He got, got in more trouble with the church. But uh, So Galileo was the first of these men to use a telescope. So that was a huge, huge deal. He could see things that nobody could see at that time. So with this Galileo one of the big discoveries Galileo made was he discovered whoops I didn't mean to do that I meant to get maybe a yellow pen here he discovered the moons of Jupiter so this is that really cool you know you can actually get a really cheap telescope like 40 like I, I have a $40 telescope and it's really cool you can see the moons of Jupiter with like even a cheapy telescope and maybe even a good pair of binoculars if any of you have a good pair of binoculars, sometimes you can see the moons of Jupiter. Um, you can't see all of them because there's actually like 50 moons, but you can see the five big ones, okay? So um, that was very, very interesting, okay? He discovered that there were moons orbiting around Jupiter, and that proved that Earth is not the sole center of orbit in the solar system, so that other bodies are orbiting around other things. He could also see, another thing that he realized is that um, Venus and Jupiter and the other planets are not stars. They're not points of light. They are actual like rocky bodies that would, you know, they're, they're circular. They're not just points of light, not just balls of fire, which they kind of look like in the night sky, right? Um, another thing he noticed is that Venus is, uh, goes through, it goes through phases just like the moon. So it'll be, you know, different parts of Venus are illuminated. Well, that means that Venus must be orbiting around its source of light, which is presumably the sun. Okay, so that means that Venus is going around the sun. And if Venus is going around the sun, why aren't we going around the sun? So Venus isn't going around Earth, it's going around the sun. So that was another kind of nail in the coffin for geocentrism. And that's really kind of what brought about heliocentrism and also kind of also uh, the advent of the scientific revolution, you know, in the Enlightenment. So it was, it was a big, 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 big deal, you know, Galileo, not only for science, but also for a history of uh, Western civilization. So anyway, um, that's kind of a little history of the science of astronomy. Moving on, just some other things about the night sky. I want to just cover a few more things about the night sky. Um, we'll talk about constellations. I want to talk a little bit about the moon and about eclipses and then we'll be all done so what am i at right here right now oh 38 minutes so we're doing okay um so anyway constellations are um as you know clusters of stars in the celestial sphere there are 88 constellations and you'll notice that you know the all stars move with each other right so when we were looking at the different stars in the sky um i'm gonna get this clicked off here mercury retrograding you know they all move together okay so if we look at this is a this is a little video that shows um, a time lapse of the night sky okay so this guy's just taking a picture over of the night sky over time so instead of looking at this in the planetarium I want you to see it in real life or I guess a real video so 650 photographs 20 seconds exposure three second intervals I'm going to kind of turn down the cheesy music here. But you can see that um, the stars are rotating, right? And they're all rotating around. What are they rotating around? They're rotating around the North Star. So that star is Polaris, okay? So you can see all the stars rotate, okay? But you notice that the stars stay in the same position relative to each other. So that allows us to recognize constellations. And, const and that's great because constellations help us to map out the night sky so like for example you know when you when you find Orion's belt um, Orion's belt is always in kind of the southern part of the sky so um, it, it kind of immediately helps you to like find south 
um, if you can find um, the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is always in the northern part of the sky, so it helps you figure out which direction is north. So if you're ever lost at night, I've seriously, I've done this before. I've done this before where it's like, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. I'm like driving around in the middle of nowhere. It's nighttime. I can't see. I'm getting no cell phone coverage. I'm lost. And I've used like constellations to figure out like where I am and at least figure out if I'm going south or north or whatever. So um, it's kind of cool to, to be able to do that and to, to know which direction you're going by the stars in the sky. So anyway, um, yeah, constellations um, help us to identify different regions in the night sky. They help us to identify different directions. Um, stars with constellations are categorized according to their brightness. So alpha is the brightest star in a constellation with beta being the second. So um, for example, like um, the brightest star in the constellation Canis Major is Sirius, right? The brightest star in the constellation of Orion is Betelgeuse. So those are the alpha stars, okay? Now stars that are at varying, might be Regal actually, I can't remember. It's either Betelgeuse or Regal. But anyway, it doesn't matter. The stars are at varying distances away from Earth, okay? So, you know, some are one light year away, two light, you know, they're not in one light year away. I think the closest one is four light years away. But, you know, they're anywhere from four to 31 to more, you know, hundreds of light years away. So uh, even though they're at different distances, though, they're so far away that they appear to basically be at the same distance. OK, um, so they're so far away that they all appear to be at a single distance. And that's why they kind of rotate, basically rotate together as one unit. So this is called the celestial sphere. We call that the celestial sphere and that rotation of all the stars with each other um, relative, you know, keeping at the same orientation to each other. We call that the celestial sphere. Sorry, I got a little mosquito buzzing around me. I'm trying to slap him. Okay, so in the northern hemisphere, they rotate around Polaris, which is the north star. Okay, um, Polaris is really cool. So I showed you that video of the north star. Let me get that out. Oh, by the way, this is the link to the planetarium I was showing you if you want to play with that. I love to go on there and like, I love to go outside and like look at the night sky and be like, what star is that? What constellation is that? And try to figure it out. And like I said, they even have phone apps. I feel like it's kind of cheating, but they even have phone apps. You can go on there and you can take pictures of the stars and constellations. It'll tell you what you're looking at. So um, the North Star, like I said, is really, North Star is very cool. So our axis is pointing at the North Star. I'm trying to see if I had another video. No, I don't. Our axis of rotation points at the North Star. So um, this is kind of cool. Um, when you're at the equator, the North Star will be right on the horizon, okay? If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you cannot see the North Star. So you can only see the North Star in the North, in the Northern Hemisphere. If you're on the equator, it will be right on the it'll be right on the horizon. At the North Pole, it will be directly 90 degrees um, above you. So I'm going to show you this. We'll go here. Okay. Here. Oh, I didn't. Let me open up that. No, I don't want that one. No, I don't want that one. I want that um, planetarium. There we go. So I want to show you this. Um, we're going to find. Let's find um, the North Star. So we're going to look to the north, okay? So we're going to look to the north, and I wonder if that's it. Polaris, okay? There's Polaris, okay? Now, um, Polaris is exactly 25, or I'm sorry, not 25. Here in Corpus Christi, it's exactly 27.5 degrees above the horizon, okay? Um, if we go to the equator, so let's change our location. We'll go to the equator. Okay, so I'm going to go um, zoom out. No, I want to zoom out, actually. Okay, and let's go to the equator, all right? I'm going to go to the equator down near here, okay? I'll make it there. No, I want to go here. Sorry. Boom. Let's use, use this location, okay? You'll notice that Polaris is right on the horizon here, okay? Basically right on the horizon because we're near the equator. Now I'm going to change the location again. And let's go to the North Pole. Okay. Uh, yes, North Pole, please. Okay, so we're going to go to the North Pole. OK, 
Okay, where is Polaris? It's up there. It's directly above us. Okay, Polaris is directly above us, and we have to. Oh well, at the North Pole. Oh well, there's <laughs> can't be nighttime at the North Pole, right? Because it's it's summertime. So we have to we have to move to to winter to get. Okay, there we go. Where's Polaris? There it is. Okay, directly above us. Okay, so um, the North Pole, Polaris is going to be directly above you. So this is the cool thing. The de number of degrees that Polaris is above the horizon, if it's directly above you, it's 90 degrees above the horizon. If it's on the equator, on the horizon, it's gonna, you're, you, that's at the equator. What's really cool is that Polaris, the number of, it's, it tells you your latitude. So if, if, if it's 27.5 degrees north above the um, horizon, um, that means that your latitude is 27.5 degrees. So you can actually, this is how like ancient mariners and like people who were sailing by ship figured out their latitude and figured out their location on the earth. It's by, by looking at the angle of Polaris above the, above the horizon. It's really cool. So you can find your latitude by measuring the angle between the horizon and the North Star. So if you ever are like Carmen San Diego and you don't know where you are, you can, you can check. You know, by you can get your latitude by measuring that angle between the North Star and the horizon. So anyway, love the North Star. It's very cool. North Star is part of Ursa Minor, which is the Little Dipper. Okay, and Ursa Minor is relatively faint, so you don't usually see it very well. But it's very close to the Big Dipper, which is which is part of the. Um, you might know the Big Dipper. Some of you can usually like people can find the Big Dipper. That's part of Ursa Major. So it's more visible and it rotates around uh, Polaris during the course of a year. So you can tell the time and date actually. This is really cool. You can figure out what time and date it is by the position of Ursa Major relative to the North Star. So during the summer, here's the Big Dipper. Okay, and you'll see that it rotates around the North Star like this over the course of um, a year. And um, by the way, if you uh, can ever can't find the North Star, the tip of the Dipper, the tip of the Big Dipper, points towards Polaris, okay? So that's how you can find it. So um, just a little bit here about Earth's motion, in case you didn't know. Um, Earth rotates counter, if you're looking down, looking down on the North Pole, Earth is rotating counterclockwise around the sun, and it's also rotating at the same time counterclockwise, you know, relative, like looking down on the North Pole. So we rotate in the same direction as we orbit the sun and by the way the moon also goes in the same direction of counterclockwise looking down like on the north pole it's going counterclockwise so everything's spinning and turning in the same direction okay um, so looking down on the north pole earth rotates counterclockwise okay um, so we have rotation around um, around our axis and we also have orbit or revolution around the sun okay so um, we call this line that we're orbiting around the sun, this plane, we call it the ecliptic plane or the ecliptic line, okay? Um, by the way, I think I have a question uh, on the lecture assignment about this, but the difference between a sidereal day and a, and a mean solar day. So um, one day to us, when we talk about a day, we usually mean one complete rotation of the Earth. However, it might interest you to know that um, when we uh, when usually when we talk about a day, you know, we're talking about going from like, you know, sunrise to sunrise or sun up to sun up or whatever, you know, sunset to sunset. Um, right. So we're talking that's kind of like how we think of a day. However, it might interest you to know that we do not actually do one complete 365 degree rotation in a matter of a day. And the reason is, is because as we are spinning, we're rotating we're also revolving around the sun. And so our position to the sun is changing while we are spinning. And so actually the sun is, it's, it actually, you end up not doing a complete 365 degree turn in a matter of a 24 hour day. It's actually four minutes less. So we have this concept of a sidereal day. A sidereal day is actually how long it takes to do exactly 365 degrees of rotation uh, along our axis, okay? 
And we can actually do that relative to the stars instead of the sun because we're not going around the stars, we're going around the sun. So um, a sidereal day is 24 hours plus four minutes. So, or actually, sorry, correct that. 24 hours minus four minutes, okay? So just thought you might be interested and that's kind of, kind of trivial, but uh, I just wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, again, the ecliptic line is the apparent path of the sun against the celestial sphere. So remember I showed you that when we looked at the planetarium, right? So that red line, uh, oh, I don't have it on right now. I have to actually, let me get back to Corpus Christi instead of, instead of here. So use my location. There we go, back in Corpus Christi. So um, back in Corpus Christi, I'm going to turn on the ecliptic line. So again, the ecliptic line shows where, how the sun goes through the night sky. But also, you know, so I look over here, you see the sun is on the ecliptic line. But also, the ecliptic line is actually the intersection of the orbital plane, Earth's orbital plane with Earth. So we are rotating within the ecliptic line, the ecliptic plane, okay? And you know, our, I've, I've mentioned many times, our angle of rotation, our axis of rotation is tilted 23.5 degrees, 23 and a half degrees relative to the plane of the ecliptic, okay? So all stuff that you should know, um, the perihelion and the aphelion, uh, these are other things you should know. As I said, that our orbit is not a circle. It's not a circle at all, it's an ellipse. So um, there are times in which we are closer to the sun and times that we are further away from the sun. So um, we are actually closest to the sun on a day called the perihelion. And that is actually, believe it or not, it's, um, I'm sorry, it's actually July, July 4th over here. And this is January something, I can't remember. I actually can't remember the day of the eighth, uh, the perihelion. I have to look this up. Do I have it written down somewhere? I don't. Oh my gosh, I can't remember. I remember that, um, don't I have this written down anywhere? Oh. I do remember that the um, aphelion, which is the day we're furthest away from the sun, is July 4th, it's Independence Day. I can't remember when our perihelion is. I think it's sometime in January though. So um, anyway, I guess it doesn't matter. You can, you can look it up on Google later, but um, it's like May, January. I want to say January twenty third. Might be right. Okay, I give up. I give up. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna search for this. Sorry. Um, what day is the perihelion? I think it's January twenty third. Jan oh, January second. Okay, there you go. It's January second. So um, anyway, um, the perihelion is January second. Aphelion. July 4th, and these are times in which we're further, furthest away or closest to the sun. So, um, by the way, because we have our perihelion in January, uh, it's kind of weird because you might think that the reason, you know, you might think like, oh, aren't, you know, shouldn't we be like hottest in January because we're closest to the sun? And uh, it's because, you know, the tilt of the earth is really what's controlling the seasons. So it's not our average distance to the sun. So um, the, the actual changes in the distance from the sun is very minor. Um, you know, you're talking about like 150 million instead of 153 million um, mi miles away from the sun, kilometers away from the sun. So anyway, um, moving along. I uh, did want to talk a little bit about the Earth and the Moon and the phases of the Moon. Um, that's something you experience, you know, every every uh, not every day, but every month. You know, you experience another another uh, cycle of phases. So um, it takes 27.5 days for the Earth um, and the Moon for the Moon to go around the Earth. Okay, so to do one complete orbit relative to the stars, uh, actually one 360 degree orbit takes 27.5. 0.5 days to do that. However, it takes 29.5 days to go through a complete cycle from new moon to new moon. So that's called a synodic month, whereas a sidereal month is how long it actually takes the moon to go around the earth, which is 27.5 days. Um, so we have a few different cycles, a few different phases. The first phase is a new moon, okay? That's when the moon is basically right in front of the earth. Okay, so uh, it's right in front of the Earth relative to the sun. So the sun is shining behind the moon and it's illuminating the side of the moon that does not face towards us. 
by the way, I forgot to put a slide about this, um, but um, you know the same. The moon is kind of crazy because the same. Uh, we're we're basically in a gravitational lock with the moon, so we always see the same face of the moon. Okay, we never see the back side of the moon. So you know um, that you've probably heard of the dark side of the moon. Okay, that is the part of the moon, the face of the moon that is never pointed towards us. Okay, so that's what the dark side of the moon looks like. And you know, if you look at that picture, you can probably see like, er, that doesn't look like the moon. Is that a different planet? No, that's the moon, but that's the part of the moon that doesn't face us. Like, this is what we're used to when we see the moon, right? So. Um, Anyway, uh, that's because we're in a gravitational lock with the moon. So the moon is kind of rotating with us, right? And so it's rotating 24, it has a 24 hour day, just like we do, okay? It's in lock. So um, on a new moon, you know, the sun is illuminating the back side of the moon, the far side of the moon, so we don't see the illuminated side. And we don't see this side either because it's dark and we can't see it because it's dark. And also the sun is behind it, so we don't see it. So we never see a new moon. Uh, the only time we see a new moon is during a solar eclipse. Um, the next phase, going counterclockwise, you see is a waxing crescent, and then we have a first quarter. So I want to point out something to you. Um, if let me go, hold on, let me go back to the new moon. So going back to the new moon, notice that the first person to be able to see the new moon is going to be living right here, right? Because we're rotating like this. Um, right, so we're ro rotating like that. So the first person to be able to see the moon is going to be that guy. The last person to be able to see the moon is going to be this guy. Now, of course, none of these people can see the moon because you won't be able to see a new moon. But the fact is the new moon is going to rise. Basically, what is this time? This is sunrise. And right here, it's sunset, right? So the new moon rises at sunrise. It sets at sunset, okay? Now that's not going to be the same. Um, I, you know, I remember I was talking to my mother-in-law, and I said, um, I asked her, um, you know, I, I was just talking about this, the moon rising, and my mother-in-law told me the moon always rises at 6 p.m. And I was like, well, not really. In fact, not at all. In fact, the moon. She won't listen to me, but the moon actually rises at different times every day. Okay, so. Um, uh, so the the new moon will rise at sunrise. It'll set at sunset. The first quarter moon, the first guy to be able to see it is this guy, and he'll see it at noon. The last guy to be able to see it is over here, and that's that's at midnight. So a first quarter moon rises at sunrise, or sorry, rises at noon, and it sets at midnight. Okay, actually, I'll, I can go through this stuff with these slides. So um, that's the only time you ever see a new moon is when it is covering up the sun, which is uh, what, what is called a solar eclipse. Okay, so that's the only time, that's when moon's shadow is cast, you know, on the earth, and um, that's the only time you're ever going to see a new moon, okay? So the new moon rises at sunrise, it sets at sunset. A first quarter moon looks like this. Now, a first quarter moon you can see during the day or the night, and um, a first quarter moon will rise at noon and it will set at midnight. So that's why you can see it either in the day or um, at, or I mean, either at night or in the day. Okay. So it's at its highest point, the meridian point, at sunset. Okay. And by the way, the way that you know it is a first quarter moon and not a third quarter moon is that the illuminated side is on the right side. If it's on the left side, then it's going to be a um, it's going to be a third quarter. So this is a first quarter moon. You can see that the illuminated side is on the right side there. Okay. Um, next next phase we'll talk about is a full moon. So now with a full moon, we are only seeing the illuminated side because it is totally opposite of the sun. So now that we're totally opposite of the sun, we only see this illuminated side and it rises. The first person to be able to see it is over here. The last person to be able to see it is over here. And that means that it rises at sunset and it sets at sunrise. Now, it is possible during the summer when the days are longer to be able to see the full moon during the day. 
And so sometimes you'll get these really beautiful, I don't know if any of you like to fish, but like I'll see this a lot. Like during the summer, I wake up really early to fish and um, you can see the, you can see the moon, um, the full moon setting at dawn. And uh, so it's really beautiful. You know, it looks, it looks like that, right? So this is a full moon that's just about to set at dawn. How do you know it's not rising? Well, you know it's not rising because it's a full moon. Full moons rise at sunset. They set at sunrise. Okay. The next one, so going along here, so this is new moon position. This is first quarter position. This is full position. The last one we'll talk about here is the third quarter. Okay. A lot of people love to call these things half moons. Don't call it a half moon. They like to call it a half moon because it's halfway illuminated, but it's actually called a quarter moon. It's called a quarter moon because you can see there are four, there are four main positions of the moon, right? New, first quarter, full, third quarter, okay? So that's why it's called third quarter. So a third quarter, notice it looks different than the first quarter because the left side is illuminated. So that's how you know it's a third quarter and not a um, first quarter. The third quarter moon rises at midnight, it sets at noon, and it hits its highest point, its meridian point, at sunrise. Okay, so we usually don't see third quarter moons that much because it's rising at midnight it's, it's, and it's setting at noon. And uh, unless we're, you can see it in the mornings, right? Um, but even in the mornings, it's kind of near, you know, if you get up and go outside at nine o'clock in the morning, you might not see it because it's going to be near the horizon. So anyway, that's the positions of the moon. Now you might wonder, um, why don't we see a lunar eclipse every single month? Because you would think that, you know, the, the moon gets in, way of the, gets in the way of the sun every month, doesn't it? And um, the fact is it doesn't. And the reason is because um, if this, whoops, if this is uh, the orbit of the Earth, that red line is the orbit of the Earth around the sun, um, the moon is actually tilted five degrees. Its orbit is actually tilted five degrees relative to the ecliptic plane. So um, that's what causes there to be, um, that's why we don't see it every month. However, that orbit changes throughout the course of the years, the centuries, the decades, and sometimes it will, it will um, be on the same plane, same line here and it will cover up the sun and that's when we get a solar eclipse, okay? So I just wanted to show you a little bit about um, eclipses. So eclipses are when the shadows of the Earth, Moon, Sun system, um, when either the, the Earth is blocking the um, sun's rays from hitting the moon, that's a lunar eclipse, but when the moon is blocking the sun's rays from hitting the Earth, that's called a solar eclipse, okay? So when the moon's shadow is cast on the Earth, that's a solar eclipse. When the Earth's shadow is darkening the moon, that's called a lunar eclipse. So I'll show you these little videos. They're like four-minute videos from National Geographic that just explain um, lunar eclipse and then another four-minute one that shows solar eclipse, and then we'll be all done, okay? So let me show those really quick. And I'll get rid of all this stuff. North star, moon phases. Okay, let me show you. This is a, a little video on lunar eclipse, about three minutes long. A lunar eclipse happens when the Earth blocks some or all of the sun's direct light from reaching the moon. This cosmic event only takes place during a full moon, which happens once every 29 and a half days, or the length of one full That's a synodic moon month. around the Earth. So why don't we have an eclipse every month? The moon's orbit is tilted a few degrees in relation to the Earth. So the Earth, moon, and sun don't always align. When the Earth does eclipse the sun, it casts two types of shadows on the moon. A larger shadow, known as the penumbra, and a smaller, darker shadow, known as the umbra. There are three types of lunar eclipses. The first is a total lunar eclipse. So, so one thing I want to explain is um, even during a total lunar eclipse, the moon will not be totally blackened out. Instead, it'll turn red. And the reason it turns red is because um, a lot of, you know how our sky is blue, right? The sky is blue. I hope you know that. You know, with so many people, flat earth people, you never know. 
but um, I hope you know the sky is blue. So in our atmosphere, it scatters um, red light really effectively. That's why the sun, that's why you know the sky looks the color that it does. So it's scattering the red light, and that scattered red light um, ends up getting cast on the moon. So that's why it's not as it's not so simple as just the you know the sun is straight out or the earth is straight out blocking all the light from the moon. So you get all this scattered light from our atmosphere hitting the moon. And that's why it turns red. Just FYI. When the sun, moon, and earth are in perfect alignment and the moon falls within the earth's umbral shadow. Total lunar eclipses are the most striking of the three types because they turn the moon a sunset red. While shorter blue wavelengths of light are scattered outward by the earth's atmosphere, Longer red wavelengths are refracted or bent inward toward the moon, making it appear red. The brightness of the moon's red glow depends upon how much dust and clouds are in the Earth's atmosphere. Following volcanic activity, ash can block out enough light to render the moon a darker red or even near black. A partial lunar eclipse, the second type, occurs when the Earth, moon, and sun don't perfectly align so only part of the moon passes into Earth's umbra. Earth's shadow appears very dark on the side of the moon facing Earth. Last, a penumbral lunar eclipse occurs when the moon passes through Earth's penumbral shadow. The event is so subtle that most people don't even notice. The moon will appear just slightly darker than normal. Lunar eclipses occur up to three times a year and can be observed from the entire nighttime half of the Earth. Unlike during a solar eclipse, it's safe to look at the moon with the naked eye during a lunar eclipse. It is only because of the distances of the sun and moon from the Earth that we are able to witness total lunar eclipses. As the moon inches away from the Earth each year, one day, billions of years from now, the moon will be too far away to fall completely within Earth's umbral shadow. Yeah, I don't know if you know that, but the uh, moon gets a little bit further away from Earth every year. So, um, I'll show you the next one here. Okay, this is on solar eclipses. That so was on lunar eclipses, now it's on solar eclipses. Gosh, I'm so confused. There we go. A solar eclipse happens when a new moon moves between the Earth and the Sun, blocking some or all of the Sun's rays from reaching the Earth. By cosmic chance, even though the Sun is 400 times wider than the Moon, it's also 400 times farther away. Therefore, the two objects appear the same size in our sky. Astronomers are able to predict eclipses because the Earth and Moon have very predictable orbits. Why then isn't there an eclipse every month? The Moon's orbit is usually tilted a few degrees north or south in relation to the Earth. When the Moon does eclipse the Sun, it casts two types of shadows on Earth. A smaller, darker shadow known as the umbra, and a larger shadow known as the penumbra. There are four types of solar eclipses. The first and most spectacular is a total eclipse when the moon completely covers the sun's surface. A total eclipse can only be seen if you're standing within the umbral shadow. That's why the imaginary line created by this shadow as it races across Earth is known as the path of totality. People within the penumbral shadow see only a partial eclipse, the second type. From this view, Outside the path of totality, the moon passes in front of the sun off-center, never fully covering its surface. I remember we had a um, total solar eclipse. I was pretty close to the to the, like the apex of it, where there's actually you get covered by the umbral shadow. Um, I, I wasn't actually, uh, so I was only in the partial eclipse part. And probably you, you guys remember this. This is a few years ago. I think it was 2017. But... Um, and probably you got you got pretty good coverage up here in, in um, 
uh, corp or down here in Corpus Christi. But anyway, uh, it's I don't know if any of you remember what it was like, but it was crazy because like it made all the birds go crazy and all the like wildlife was chattering. It was really interesting. But anyway, um, I think that's all I'm going to show you for today. So the other kinds of eclipses are kind of complicated i don't i don't need to expose you to those so anyway um that's all for today we'll finish up with our last lecture um next time on um the solar system so i'll talk to you another time i'm gonna sign out here